the presidential challenge very much with us today um, from Israel to uh, the Islamic State and beyond. Our topic for this evening uh, suggests a purview of the world beyond simply the Middle East, and it's suggested by the recent book by our uh, commentator to this evening, uh, which I certainly recommend to all of you, The World in Conflict, Understanding uh, Global uh, Conflicts. Uh, I can tell you it's available at the Ivy Bookstore because that's where I got my copy. <laughs> I can't speak for other, other outlets. But in any case, it's an interesting treatment of the variety of conflicts in the world. And uh, we live in a troubling time. I was looking out the window of our office here in the building earlier today, and it looked very peaceful out there. And, but one's reminded that conflict is in our personal lives. It's in the city of Baltimore, certainly. Uh, it's within the nation today on a scale larger than many of us had suspected, and uh, certainly in the world. Uh, I can remember as a graduate student a long time ago, uh, reading an article in Daedalus in which it said there would be uh, 100 conflicts in, in Africa before the century was over. Uh, I admit we were giving them almost a half a century to do that, but there probably were in that period of time. Um, and we managed to uh, uh, avoid uh, the things which are at a distance uh, from us. But the question, oh, the basic question of what is the American responsibility in the world today is fundamental to any discussion of our policy. And that's implicit in the first words of this evening's uh, program, the presidential challenge. And the scope of those potential challenges is implied by the second half from, from Israel to the Islamic State and, and beyond. Uh, to reflect upon conflict, its magnitude, uh, what one can ever do anything to make a dent in it, and specifically to the responsibilities and possibilities for the United States are all on the table, it seems to me, tonight. And uh, to deal with that in an hour or so, uh, we're delighted to have Mr. John Andrews of The Economist. Uh, thank you very much indeed, Frank, and thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for being here tonight. And I would like to give a, actually a little word of specific thanks to Bailey Morris Eck for introducing me to your group, and also to Sam Dell, um, who not only um, is a part of a, one of your trustees, but he has very generously agreed to lodge my wife and me this evening. We would have stayed with Bailey, but her boiler blew up. <laughs> Fortunately, she has survived and is looking as lovely as ever. Um, I must say, these surroundings are terrific. I have given several speeches in my, uh, my life, um, but never, I think, with a view quite as splendid as this. Whether this particular talk will be equal to, um, to the view. I leave it to you to judge, but I hope so. Um, anyway, as you know, as Frank said, the, the title of this is The Presidential Challenge, From Israel to the Islamic State and Beyond. And having been, um, I suppose, inflicted is probably the right word with cable TV in the last few days, I'm well aware that today is Super Tuesday. Uh, I hesitate, frankly, to predict the choice that you and your fellow citizens will take <laughs> in November. But rest assured that we, on the other side of the Atlantic, are fascinated. Um, some might say appalled <laughs> by the antics of the primary season. But what is clear, though, I mean, to be slightly more serious, is that your choice matters not just to you as Americans, but to the rest of the world too. Now, Madeleine Albright, you may remember, said back in 1998, it's a phrase that has often been used, America is the indispensable nation. Hubert Vredrine, who was France's foreign minister at the time, and when we were based in Paris, Hubert uh, Vredrine said, uh, he followed up by describing America as a hyperpuissance, the implication being that a hyperpower is a bit more than being a mere superpower. 
Well, those were the days, you know, end of the 90s. It's before 9-11, before the invasion of Afghanistan, before the Iraq war, before, of course, the rise of ISIS or ISIL, whichever acronym you want to use, and before the establishment of the so-called Islamic State. And I might add, it was also before Vladimir Putin diminished the notion of the American hyperpuissance by annexing Crimea and by intervening in Syria in support of Bashar al-Assad. So no wonder that one of the uh, candidates for presidency, a certain Mr. Trump, um, no wonder you have the Donald's promise to make America great again. And no wonder it seems to appeal, bizarrely perhaps, to so many. I don't want to be too sort of, you know, provocative in this. <clears throat> it is, however, I would suggest, actually, an empty slogan. America doesn't have to be great again. It is already great. America, the United States, accounts for roughly 40%, perhaps more, of the world's spending on defense. That means from bunker-busting missiles to the world and bombs to the world's most advanced submarines and jet fighters. It has a military presence of one kind or another in score, literally scores of foreign nations. You may remember that in 2011, Congressman Ron Paul, in his doomed attempt for the presidency, said, we're under great, I'm tempted to try an American accent, but I won't. Uh, you'll, be, you'll be relieved to know. Uh, he said, we're under great threat because we occupy so many countries. We're in 130 countries. Well, was that true? When the Washington Post fact-checked this claim, it found that Paul, Ron Paul's figure was actually on the low side. The Post managed to find 153 countries hosting US military personnel. Now, I have no idea what the uh, number is today, but when I was writing my book, I checked with the Pentagon, the DOD, and I found that in 2014, US Special Forces, you know, the SEALs, the Green Berets, and so on, they were deployed in 133 different countries. So you are already a great nation, especially in military terms. So the bottom line is that in conventional military terms, America reigns supreme. And I think it will continue, continue to do so for decades to come. Notice I say, use, use the word conventional. So why the angst? Why the Donald, etc.? Why did General Martin Dempsey, who was then the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, tell the House Appropriations Committee in 2012? I won't, well, I won't try an American accent again. Um, in my personal military judgment, formed over 38 years, we are living in the most dangerous time in my lifetime right now. Now, Dempsey is a man not to be ignored. So why did he say this? Well, one answer, of course, is that generals like their military toys. In his farewell speech as president, Dwight Eisenhower famously warned against the military-industrial complex. But there's also a different answer, which you know, I explain in the book. It's the difficulty, I'm tempted to say the impossibility, that all American, that all governments have, American and others, have in dealing with asymmetric warfare. Is it asymmetric or asymmetric? I used the word the other day, and I, asymmetric, I, say, I need to check on these things. Um, now, asymmetric warfare is a concept that has been around ever since David used a slingshot to slay Goliath. It didn't take high technology for Al-Qaeda to commit the outrage of 9-11, and you can see the girders down below this World Trade Center taken from 9-11 and the twisted metal. It should remind us all uh, of that horrible event. But it didn't take high technology. It just needed young men who could point a plane at their targets. They didn't need to master the art of landing a plane. And so too with the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq. An IED 
you know, an improvised explosive device. It's not exactly high tech. I mean, I'm not sure I could do it because I'm useless at all this kind of stuff, but it's just explosive material detonated usually by a cell phone from someone a bit further away. And the lowest tech of all is the suicide bomber. American embassies today are like fortresses. It really is horrible, actually. Now, why are they like that? It's because in 1983, a suicide bomber drove a truck into the American embassy in Beirut, just around the corner from where my wife and I and our son used to live, They're literally just around the corner. And they killed, the suicide bomber killed 63 people. Not all, not, actually most of them were not Americans. Six months later, another suicide bomber killed 241 American Marines and 58 French servicemen in an attack on the barracks in Beirut of the multinational peacekeeping force. And so it goes. Suicide attacks on American targets, for example, at Saudi Arabia's Khobar Towers in 1996, two years later, 1998, at the US embassies in Tanzania and Nairobi. In other words, 9-11 may have come literally out of a blue sky, but it didn't come out of the blue sky in terms of, of history. That history, it's important to realize in this primary season, embraces both Republican and Democratic administrations here in the US. And in the partisan gridlock of Washington, it's obviously easy for both sides to find fault with each other. Few people will have shed tears for Saddam Hussein or for Muammar al-Gaddafi. But one was toppled under a GOP administration and the other under Barack Obama's watch. But both regime changes, I would submit, are examples of be careful what you wish for. The aftermath of both is part of the challenge which will uh, face your next president come January 2017. Now, I say challenge, but of course, it's really challenges in the plural. Dealing with Congress, the economy, illegal immigration, the relationship with China, the NATO alliance, the European Union, and we in Britain now are considering leaving the European Union, which I personally regard as madness, but there we are, we can come on to that later. But that's one of the problems that actually Washington will have to face. The difficult relationship that the next president may or may not have with Putin's Russia, and of course the perennial question of North Korea. Whoever becomes president will have plenty on, which pronoun should I use? Her or his plate. Now, <clears throat> I want to concentrate on an area though that has preoccupied successive presidencies, the Middle East, and by extension, much of the Muslim world. The subtitle, as Frank said, of my talk today is From Israel to the Islamic State and beyond. Now, why Israel? I don't want to imply that Israel is a direct cause of Islamist extremism at all. A much more proximate cause is the incompetence and the corruption of virtually all Arab governments and their failure to satisfy the reasonable aspirations of populations which, in every case, are growing very rapidly. At some point, you know, when a government invokes the presence of Israel and the plight of the Palestinians as a scapegoat for their own shortcomings, that doesn't convince citizens who simply want a job and a decent future. You may remember that the Arab Spring started in December 2010 when Mohammed Bouazizi, a Tunisian street vendor, vendor, set himself on fire. And that set off the Arab Spring because well, he wasn't protesting against Israel. He just wanted to earn a living and to stop being hassled by police, by cops, trying to get uh, bribes. That's one proximate cause. A second proximate cause of Islamist extremism is the spread of Saudi Arabia's Wahhabi uh, brand of Islam via mosques and madrasas, madrasas, uh, you know, Islamic schools, funded by the kingdom's petrodollars. Now, I don't want to conflate exactly the doctrine and behavior 
of the Islamic State with those of the kingdom. I mean, Saudi Arabia is not a takfiri state. Takfir means to call someone a kafir, an unbeliever, and therefore, according to the Islamic State, worthy of death. Now, the Islamic, the Saudi Arabia is not a takfiri state. It doesn't denounce Shia Muslims as heretics to be slaughtered. But frankly, there's no denying the similarities between what the Islamic State practices in its doctrine and in its punishments and those of the Saudi Arabian regime. Now, the Saud family is well aware that it is vulnerable, that ISIS, that the Islamic State, has Saudi Arabia in its sight. And you all know that of the 19 9-11 hijackers, 15 were Saudi nationals. Indeed, if you go back to the 1980s and the successful campaign to drive Saudi troops, uh, sorry, to drive Soviet troops out of Afghanistan, you'll find among the Mujahideen a certain Osama bin Laden. Now, the Mujahideen were supported and financed by Saudi Arabia and also by the United States and others, but principally by those two countries. So again, this is a warning, an injunction, with hindsight, I admit, to be careful what you wish for. Bin Laden's original quarrel with the Saudi government and with America was the Saudi invitation for American troops to be based in Saudi Arabia, the guardian, after all, of Islam's holiest places, ahead of the first Gulf War. That was, you know, Desert Storm. Well, my reason, though, for to come back to Israel, for, increase, for including Israel as a presidential challenge is actually threefold. First, it's an important ingredient in American politics in a way that the rest of the world very rarely appreciates. America's reflexive support for Israel, almost right or wrong, and I say reflexive, and it's a word that can sound rather nasty, but I don't mean it in that way, but it is a sort of, it's deep down, it's felt. And now that reflexive support for Israel simply doesn't have a parallel in Europe. And it's worth bearing that in mind. This support, I think, is the basic reason why America's standing in the Muslim world is so low. And an interesting sidelight, by the way, is that President Obama is regarded unfair, unfavorably, um, not just by the Israelis, but also by the Palestinians. Anyway, second, the second reason is really um, for this for Israel being this, is that it's a, a, triumph of, you know, a triumph of hope over experience. Almost every president seeking a legacy, and they all want to have a legacy when they leave office, almost every president is tempted to seek a lasting solution to the Arab-Israeli issue. I mean, Bill Clinton came very, very close. George W. Bush and his neocon advisors, they thought the Iraq war would lead to democracy in the Arab world, and so the acceptance of Israel, which after all is a democracy. And theory is, you know, democracies don't fight each other. That's the basic argument. And in George W's term, the Annapolis meeting of 2007 was his attempt in a second term to find common ground between Israelis and Palestinians. Now, what do you do with Barack Obama? I think Barack Obama, may have subcontracted the task of John Kerry, who after all was a rival at one time for the, the uh, candidacy. But the legacy, of notion, the legacy notion, I think, still holds true. Now, the third reason that Israel is a major actor in a region which is in dangerous flux uh, is that it will concern America for decades to come. Think, for example, of Israel's fierce opposition to the nuclear deal with Iran reached last summer by the permanent five members of the UN Security Council plus Germany. Ironically, Israel's opposition mirrors that of Saudi Arabia. Personally, I believe that the Iran deal, and you may remember that Iran had elections just yesterday. Uh, personally, I believe that the Iran deal is a welcome step forward after the missed opportunities of the George W. years. But there's no denying that 
in the great game of the Middle East. Remember, the, we, the Brits, when we were a superpower, we had a great game about Russia, India, Afghanistan, etc. We've got a new great game. There's no denying that in the present great game of the Middle East, all the pieces are in motion. Syria is a disaster. Iraq threatens to fragment. The Arab Spring has led to three failed states, Syria, Libya, Yemen, joining Somalia in that category. The Taliban are back in Afghanistan. And Pakistan, I'm stretching Middle East geography here a bit, it's like an episode of Homeland. It's almost a failed state, but it's one that has nuclear weapons. So, no wonder many voices in America, I don't know if there are any here, but many voices in America say, to hell with the rest of the world. Let's just leave them to it. As George Washington said two centuries ago, it's, this is not quite an accurate quote, but it's a good, the paraphrase is good enough, beware foreign entanglements. But actually, those foreign entanglements are inevitable. They're part and parcel of being a superpower, and they're part and parcel increasingly so when you, this superpower is dealing with a globalized economy. There's no way in which your next president, she or he, he or she, can avoid being sucked into the maelstrom of the Middle East. Now, the immediate challenge, I think, is bound to be Syria. I cannot imagine a solution before the president takes office in January. And it's pretty hard to imagine the Islamic State being defeated in the short term. One reason the Islamic State will not be soon defeated is the reluctance of outside powers, so far at any rate, with the possible exception of Saudi Arabia and Turkey, of, to put boots on the ground. I do not think there will be any enthusiasm in the United States to put any boots on the ground, apart, of course, from those ubiquitous special forces. And we shouldn't dismiss that. They can be very effective, the SAS in Britain, uh, the Green Berets, the SEALs, etc., from the United States. But it's not the same as boots on the ground in, in the, the conventional terms. But actually, the Syrian conflict is part of a much larger problem in the Middle East. One aspect that will confront the next president, president is that the Islamic State, Daesh, as they like to call it, Adalat al Islamiyah al Iraq Sham, has, in effect, erased the frontiers agreed in 1916 by Britain's Sir, Mike's, Sir Mark Sykes and France's François-Georges Picot. Those, of course, were the days when <coughs> we were the leading superpower. <laughs> now, if those Sykes-Picot lines are gone forever, and they may well be, you know, it's like you, you squeeze the toothpaste out of the tube, how do you get it back in? What is the future for Jordan, which is another colonial creation? What's the future for Iraq, already close to dismemberment between Shia, Sunni, and Kurdish regions? Well, Russia's involvement in Syria may or may not complicate things. It certainly rings lots of alarm bells. And one way of looking at its support for the Assad regime is you know, the metaphor of putting the genie back in the bottle, putting the toothpaste back in the tube. I mean, Putin wants somehow to return Syria to a secular dictatorship when the alternative might otherwise be an apocalyptic theocracy. And I think that choice, in a way, was there right at the beginning. And with hindsight, I think it was a mistake of us. By us, I mean the West in general, to say that Assad must go as a precondition for peace talks. Anyway, the challenge actually, of course, goes beyond Syria. The long-term issue, I think, for the next president will actually be America's relationship with Saudi Arabia and Iran, and then the relationship of those two nations with each other. They are really the two regional powers. Iran, potentially much more so than Saudi Arabia, which has a much smaller population. Now, I hardly need to detail the difficulties that Washington and Tehran have had with each other ever since the fall of the Shah and the subsequent um, hostage crisis. America sees the Islamic Republic of Iran 
still as an exporter of terrorism, possibly with good reason. Um, Iran, for its part, notes the role of the CIA and Britain's MI6 in removing the Mossadegh government in 1953. So the Islamic Republic of Iran likes to describe the US as the great Satan. We, as a measure of our less than our diminishing power, are merely the little Satan. <laughs> but I do actually, I don't want to be too gloomy, I do see genuine hope that the situation with Iran will improve. And I think my view is actually bolstered by the results of the election there. Remember that ordinary Iranians tend to have very positive views of America, not of the US government, but of America as a nation. It's important to underline that. So assuming that the nuclear deal sticks, and as I said before, I think it will, the Iranian economy will improve, and the hardliners in Iran will have to cede ground to those in Iran who want a reformed nation, open to the world. So ironically then, the bigger challenge for the next president, the next denizen of the Oval Office, is going to be the relationship with Saudi Arabia. And that Saudis have been an ally ever since the United States, way back in 1931, who recognized the realm of Abdulaziz al Saud. Now, for decades, that relationship served both countries well. The Saud family had the ultimate protection of the United States, and America had guaranteed access to the world's richest oil reserves. And there is still value in that bargain. I mean, Saudi intelligence on Islamist terrorism is extremely important for America and for everybody in Europe, so one should not dismiss it. But what happens next? I mean, the Saudis have a paranoid fear of Iran. In part, that's the traditional antipathy between Arabs and Persians. But more immediately, I think it's the Saudi fear that Iran is intent on regional mastery. The Saudis note Iran's links to fellow Shia Muslims in Lebanon via Hezbollah. They note the support in Syria for Bashar al-Assad, who's a member of the Alawites, which is a kind of a quasi-Shiite sect. And they note Iran's involvement with the Shia majority in Bahrain, ruled by a Sunni uh, ruling family. And, uh, and they also note Iran's support, covert or overt, uh, with the, of the Zaydi Shiite Houthi insurgents in Yemen, which actually is a pretty dreadful war that is not really being covered. Now, against that background, the Saudis are very, very disappointed, it's a very kind word, with the Obama administration. First, because the president did not punish the Assad regime when it crossed the Obama famous red lines on the use of chemical weapons. And I think, personally, that was a mistake on Obama's part. And it's also, they're also disappointed because of the president, uh, uh, president's efforts success, succeeding to reach the nuclear deal with Iran. Now, but let's look at it, that particular thing from the other vantage point. How does America now view Saudi Arabia? Well, fracking, which my wife doesn't like, as she thinks it causes all sorts of environmental problems, but I'm not sure she's the person to listen to on this. <laughs> um, frac Sorry, Hillary. Uh, that's my Hillary, not, not the one. <laughs> uh, fracking has actually eliminated America's reliance on Saudi oil, and it's becoming, at the same time, harder and harder for the United States to ignore the very real Saudi abuses of human rights. And it's also becoming hard, as I said earlier, to ignore the fact that so much of the Islamic State's doctrine actually stems from Saudi thinking. An awful lot of its fighters and its finances have come not from the Saudi government, but from Saudi citizens. So, how should President Hillary or the Donald or whoever you choose in your wisdom deal with these and many other challenges?
for example, Pakistan's duplicity in foreign policy, or China's island building in the South China Sea, or the risk that Turkey, a fellow member of NATO, don't forget, will come, in fact, has the biggest forces in NATO other than the United States, the risk that Turkey will come to blows, to real blows, with Putin's Russia. I mean, so far, there's been one plane shot down, but things can obviously always escalate. Well, these are things that we, subjects we can talk about in Q&A, if you like, but allow me to make three modest suggestions. First, I think that the next president, I'm not sure whether the Donald will be capable of this, but Hillary would, uh, well, let me not inject any personal uh, views in this. Um, first, I think the next president should listen to professional diplomats before being swayed by the think tanks. The State Department is full of real experts with no vested interest in promoting a particular point of view. That is not true of many of the think tanks. The disaster of Iraq, and I think it is obviously a disaster, is primarily the fault of the Bush administration, in my view, embracing the views of neoconservative think tanks and of listening to the Pentagon rather than to the folks at Foggy Bottom. It was never in doubt that America's military, the best in the world, would defeat Saddam. In fact, I remember saying to the editor of The Economist at the time, look, Saddam will be defeated in three weeks, and I was just right. But I said, what worries me is the aftermath. To my chagrin, The Economist at the time supported the war, but no, that's, these things happen. Uh, we are a broad church. Um, <laughs> but I think the failure, frankly, and we have actually admitted this, the failure to plan for the aftermath really is a lasting shame on the Bush years. Now, the second suggestion I have to the president, be sure to do what you say and to say what you mean. I do admire Obama's rational approach to politics and his refusal to be gung-ho in foreign policy. It reminds me, actually, of when Harry Truman sensibly refused to let General MacArthur invade communist China. And you certainly don't get a sort of a glib axis of evil concept in an Obama speech. But I think Obama's change of mind in 2013 on his red lines in Syria has genuinely undermined American credibility in the world. And I think, personally, that it was a mistake. And as a result of that, just imagine how nervous the Baltic states, Lithuania, Estonia, Latvia, must now feel when they're confronted by an aggressive Putin who has just you know, sort of called the West bluff in Ukraine. Well, will the NATO guarantee still hold is what they ask themselves? Or when push comes to shove, will the US, and after all the US is really the prime mover in NATO, will it back down? My last suggestion is simply recognize that the world is a complicated place and that America's powers are not unlimited. I mean, of course, the United States and its allies could easily destroy the Islamic State militarily. But at what cost? You know, what would happen if you nuked Raqqa, for example? As I think one of the uh, intending nominees has suggested. As Donald Rumsfeld once mused, are we creating more terrorists than we're killing. Islamic, Islamist extremism is not going to be defeated by force, nor by our criticism. Instead, it's going to need a change of narrative within the Muslim world. That's not going to happen overnight. I think we just have to accept that. I mean, it's going through a generational transformation there. But what would certainly help is the exercise by the United States of what Joseph Nye has termed soft power, the kind of soft power that the world will admire and listen to, is the America that projects an aura of freedom and of universal rights. It's not going to respond to an isolationist America, certainly not one that, I'm treading dangerous ground here, 
that builds a wall along the southern border and demands that Mexico pay for it. My apologies in advance to President Trump. But let me end by going back to General Dempsey's view that the world has never been more dangerous. Now, in one sense, he's obviously wrong. States these days very rarely go to war with one another. Most wars actually are civil wars within states, or they are insurgencies such as with ISIS or Qaeda or Boko Haram that cross frontiers. They're not aimed at any particular state from a, a state agency. In the Second World War, the death rate, uh, which we, of course, count from 1939, you guys from 1941, um, but as Churchill said, you know, Americans will always do the right thing, having exhausted all other possibilities. <laughs> Forgive me. Uh, anyway, uh, if you look, I mean, you know, statistics are always kind of slightly um, dodgy, and the Economist deals in lots of statistics. But if you look at the death, the uh, the guesses, the estimates for the death, the toll, the death toll in the Second World War, it goes between 55 million and 80 million. So you can say the death rate really ran at more than 10 million a year. Well, from 1950 to 1989, that is, those were the years of the Cold War, but they also included the conflicts of the Korean War and the Vietnam War. Vietnam War. The death rate actually fell to around 180,000 a year. And in the first decade of this century, it declined still more to around 55,000 a year. So no wonder, you know, Francis Fukuyama at one point declared the end of history. It was the, uh, the victory of Western, democratic, capitalist, liberal practice, etc. And George H.W. Bush talked about the new world order. Well, that had a certain validity. But we mustn't be complacent. The graph now is ticking upwards, and that's largely because of the conflict in Syria. And of course, there must be a risk, perhaps through human error, and however unwanted, that Turkey and Russia go to war and drag the rest of us in it with them. And meanwhile, you also still have the risk of war in the Korean Peninsula, with that young madman, who we think is mad, who we don't really know, Kim Jong-un, and also you still have a frozen conflict between India and Pakistan over Kashmir with no guarantee that at some point it won't melt again and they'll have yet another war. Harold Macmillan, a British Prime Minister in the 1960s, that, is that glorious decade that I'm sure some of you remember, uh, was once asked, what was the greatest threat in politics? And his reply, he said, Events, dear boy. Events. <laughs> well, whoever your next president turns out to be, there will certainly be plenty of events. Let's hope that the president, he or she, reacts appropriately. As George Santayana once said, and he was speaking just after the end of the First World War, and there have been plenty of wars since, he wisely said, only the dead have seen the end of war. Thank you very much. Well, I know we all certainly thank our guests for that presentation. I should have mentioned earlier, that, and he implied that you can ask about a lot of the world, but he has a, a experience uh, with the Middle East, which is extensive, of course. He's uh, been the uh, correspondent for Southeast Asia, for China, the editor for Asia with The Economist. Uh, he's uh, been stationed in Paris, head of mission, as well as twice in the United States, Washington and, and Los Angeles, and uh, has written two books on Asia, uh, one on Europe, and uh, another dimension which you didn't quite allude to. He was the co-editor of a book on uh, 2050 mega change, 
uh, as well as his uh, comments that are suggested tonight. So uh, in terms of someone being able to cover the waterfront, uh, our guests can do it, and he's delighted to answer your questions. Thank you, Frank. Uh, gentleman at the back. Uh, I'm going to repeat the question because I know that you are recording this, live streaming it, and we don't have the microphones to go around. <clears throat> question, very good question. Uh, will the next president have a European ally willing to fight uh, with the U.S. Uh, against um, against Putin's Russia if it becomes aggressive in, against the Baltic states? Was that the correct? Or more like Turkey. Or more like, or to support Turkey. Yeah. Okay. Um, it's a very good question, and hmm. <laughs> <laughs> mm. You know, the reason it's a very good question, actually, is that uh, Article 5 of NATO has only really been suggested once, and that was when um, America uh, invaded Afghanistan. And France, at the time, volunteered to support the United States in going into Afghanistan then. I mean, talking about the, the original 2001 uh, invasion. And um, Washington said, no, we don't want you. <laughs> so I think actually a lot will depend on what the United States asks for. Now, I can't imagine that if there were an attack on Turkey, if Turkey and Russia came to blows, or if Russia were somehow to take uh, aggression, uh, to be openly aggressive in the Baltic states, that the United States would want to go it alone. It's not equivalent to the invasion of Afghanistan and the toppling of the Taliban regime. So I think uh, the US would ask, and I think we would respond. I think we would, because to ignore the United States, when the United States really wants something, is one hell of a gamble. Um, Britain, for example, has, if you go back to 1956 and the Suez Adventure, when Britain, France, and Israel took control of the Suez Canal, it was um, Eisenhower who made us leave. Now, the lesson that the French took from that was it is impossible to defy America on our own. Therefore, we need a united Europe, so European Union, as it became. The lesson the Brits took was it is impossible to defy America and go it alone. So we will be with America, come what may. And critics of Britain will say, oh, you're all, you've always been America's poodle. And they had said that about Tony Blair's administration. Um, and I think, uh, in a sense, they're right. The only time that a British prime minister has um, denied a request from the United States was when Harold Wilson refused to send British troops to Vietnam. By contrast, Australia did. But that, I think, is the only occasion that I can think of. So I think the short answer is, yes, we would respond. We would do our damnedest to make sure that, that we as a NATO alliance did not have to respond. And I th can't really imagine that uh, Russia would take open military action against the Baltic states. I think it would be much more likely to be the sort of action that is taken in eastern Ukraine. Uh, that is much more difficult to deal with because it's not declared war. And I think uh, we'd all have to actually hand things over to the diplomats to try and sort out some sort of fudge. Turkey would be a much, much more difficult case, um, not least because uh, Turkey's role in the Middle East is so ambivalent and not at all close to America's role at the moment, nor actually um, that of uh, the European Union. The lady would like to know what my thoughts are on the 
uh, the refugee crisis, the wave of migration, uh, especially into the European Union, I think is what you meant. Um, I mean, after all, Germany last year, in 2015, received 1.1 million refugees or economic migrants. I think, you know, we, people often like to make a distinction between refugees fleeing persecution and war and those who are economic migrants seeking a better life. And, of course, there is often a huge overlap. Refugees are entitled to asylum, economic migrants are not. But in practical terms, uh, the two overlap because if someone is coming from a very difficult country, it's pretty well impossible to send them back. It is an enormous problem now, and it is actually, uh, I mean, be careful what you wish for. I mean, Iraq has spawned lots of refugees, so has Afghanistan. Most now, I, by most, I mean I'm talking about majority, because waves keep coming from all over the place, uh, come from the Syrian civil war. And Syria had about 20, a population of about 22 million. Half that population has been displaced. That doesn't mean they've all left Syria, but about four to five million have. One million are in Lebanon. Now, Lebanon is a country of around four million, maybe. So now you have an extra quarter of the population putting enormous strain on an economy and a country which is already quite fragile. You have the same problem in Jordan. You have hundreds of thousands of refugees in, um, in Turkey. Now, this could actually, if you want to be really uh, gloomy, be the end of the European Union because part of the European Union's ideal is there should be freedom of movement within Europe. Well, what you're getting now is country after country setting up physical barriers. And also you've got a real uh, tendency for the extreme right to come up. And you're getting the sort of uh, fascist um, elements and fascist speech. It's, it's really very disturbing. I don't think there is any easy answer because uh, you know, if you look at the whole numbers, okay, the European Union has 500 million people. So to accept 1 million or 2 million or 3 million or 4 million or 5 million should not be that difficult in numerical terms. But the point is everybody wants to go to just certain countries, Germany or Denmark or Sweden or Britain. Uh, I mean... There are thousands of people in deplorable conditions outside Calais in France trying so hard to get to Britain. They're not, for the most part, refugees from Syria. They're from all over the place, from Africa, from uh, India, from Bangladesh. But they want to go to Britain because it's easy to find a job. It's, it, most will speak some English. They may well have relatives there. But, you know, you're getting this whole sort of, oh, we must secure our borders. Well, it's a very, very natural response. And I can't offer any um, solution to this. It just is very, very difficult. And if only one could somehow solve the civil war, end the civil war in Syria, this would do be a huge plus. Uh, in the meantime, it would make more sense to allow refugees to work, to actually um, you know, earn money rather than be a drain on the society they're in. But that is very controversial. I mean, Lebanon, for example, never did not ever give work permits to Palestinian refugees, which means there's sort of a, a tension there. They're certainly not to give, going to give work permits to Syrian refugees because it would disturb the whole fragile um, stability. That's, so I, I'm, I wish I could give you a, a, a decent answer, but I, I can't, and I'm in good company. I don't think anybody has been able to. And when <coughs> Peter Sutherland, who's a former uh, EU commissioner from, uh, from Ireland, says, oh, but just look at the numbers, we could easily accommodate 1 million, 2 million, 3 million. Yes, he's right in terms of the basic arithmetic, but that takes no account of the political realities and the social realities. Uh, the question was, uh, why didn't 
the US, Britain, and France, uh, establish a protected enclave in Syria to which uh, Syrians could flee the fighting and be protected rather than having to flee the country and so on? Uh, it's a good question. Uh, I think the answer actually is, um, well, two. One is that I think um, we're no longer in an era where it's, we think it's reasonable to keep interfering in foreign countries, uh, even though we do. Um, the second reason, I think it's the more powerful reason, is the, um, the legacy of Iraq and Afghanistan, especially Iraq, and the feeling that, I know, and now actually Libya, because, I mean Libya happened after the Syrian thing had started. <coughs> but we, I mean the reaction is, oh my God, not another uh, involvement in the Middle East and the Muslim world. It'll all end in tears. Let's not do it. And that's why um, United States, Britain, France, they all say we're not going to put boots on the ground. And establishing a protected enclave would have involved boots on the ground. And nobody has the, now you might say nobody has the guts to do it, but uh, I think, you know, maybe so, but no one actually has the will to do it. They think that the downside potentially is too great. Yeah, the question was, um, didn't the Crusaders entertain the same idea and then realize that actually you can't sustain military forces abroad? And I think that's true. And of course, that, uh, I mean, you mentioned the Crusaders, and it's a long time since I read Runciman, but um, I do remember that George W. at one point talked about a crusade and very quickly had to backtrack because it's not a word that the Muslim uh, world particularly um, uh, is, is, <laughs> is enamored by. Uh, yeah, I mean, you get, you, 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 if you put military people um, in another country, you have to then exert power. I mean, military people are there for power. That means you effectively become the governing power, so you're back in imperialism. And uh, that is something which, you know, we don't find acceptable now. Uh, I mean, even though I dare say you will find lots of people around the world, even in develop developing countries, saying, oh, things are much better when the British ran the show or the French ran the show. I mean, look at Côte d'Ivoire, for example, Ivory Coast. It was far more prosperous and far more settled and far freer, actually, when it was a French colony. Uh, that's, uh, I'm afraid that people develop in their own way at their own pace, and we, uh, that's the name of the game. The question was, um, could Israel, which has a lot of power, deal more effectively with the Palestinians? Um, and how? Well, <laughs> this is a question that has eluded an answer uh, since 1948, and, and <laughs> arguably before, uh, if you go back to before the actual establishment of the State of Israel. Um, Israel is the one genuine democracy in the Middle East, although, of course, a lot of Palestinians would say, actually, that's not true. Arab Israelis are second-class citizens, and Palestinians in the West Bank occupied territories are third-class citizens. But um, I think there really is the potential for a solution. The problem is that the solution has been cast as a two-state solution, which I think made a lot of um, attractive initial sense. But I do wonder whether the, the two-state solution has become almost impossible. And I mean, the Palestinians like to say that the Arab-Israeli dispute is the mother of all the problems in the Middle East. Well, actually, I think that may have been true at one time, but I don't think it's true now. I think mother has been put into a retirement home somewhere and is, is sort of being ignored. 
Uh, I mean, if I were an Israeli politician, I would find it pretty hard to push uh, for peace talks at the moment with the Arab world because you've got Islamic State in Syria, you've got uh, turmoil all around you, you've got no real guarantee that King uh, Abdullah in, uh, in Jordan will survive. And so it's all a mess. So the, the, the temptation will be to do nothing, or at least do nothing immediately. But that, of course, only prolongs the problem. I mean, at some point, Israelis and Palestinians have to learn to live together. Now, ideally, I think that would have been a two-state solution. It got very close to it with uh, President Clinton, and the Clinton parameters made a lot of sense, and both sides basically agreed on them, just minor land swaps. But, you know, Arafat backed down, and I think stupidly, in my opinion. Um, it didn't happen. Could it happen now? Yes, but I don't see it happening immediately. And so the alternative would be, I suppose, a one-state solution. Now, a one-state solution, what sort of state would that be? I mean, the ethos of Israel is that it's a state whose majority population will be Jewish. And so, you know, Netanyahu says, Palestinians, you've got to accept us as a Jewish state. The Palestinians say, oh, but if we do that as a Jewish state, then we are automatically consigning ourselves, Muslims and Christians, to an inferior status. So, you know, you've got this play on words, but I think you have to ask yourself uh, whether the play on words is just a way of delaying any real attempt to solve the, the, the crisis, because people can live with the crisis. The amount of death is not enough to actually change things. Unless you get, I mean, people now say there's a third intifada going on. I think that's kind of um, an exaggeration. Yet it could, they, it could become one, and that might concentrate a few minds. But essentially, I'm, I'm not terribly optimistic. I wish I could be, uh, but we are where we are, as that wonderful American phrase has it. I think everybody's ready to spend much more of the evening. And obviously, all of us thank you very, very much for an absolutely splendid affair. Frank, thank you very, very much. And thank you very much, all of you, for coming here and for your questions. Um, all you have to do now to make me really happy is buy my book. I don't mind. I'm happy for you to go on Amazon. <laughs> thank you so much.